On today's show, how permanent life insurance can be a major tax diversification asset. Part four of this week's new tax reduction strategies with nationally recognized product taxation expert, Ken Davis, CLU, CHFC, CFP, and CPA. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Backroom Technician. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome to day four, Ken. Hey, Steve. Well, I'm sitting here with Ken, who I've known for 25 years. We've been talking about this, I'd like to say, and I don't mean to really push this. I think I helped Ken along his Damascus Road experience <laughs> of coming into the dark side here, you know, or the life, life insurance and deferred products. I've just been likened to St. Paul? Oh, uh, my gosh. Uh, yes, I have to say, you are St. Ken. St. Ken. <laughs> no, no, no. And no. now, Ken, we, we not only, not only Ken and I is Ken today, but we want to elevate him to, he's really becoming hugely active between industries. He's really taking our message and our gospel, basically, if you want to stay within the metaphor, and he's taking it to the fiduciary market, and they listen to him, and they see that. And we've been teaching in the CPA Society in the past, and this is the first time we're seeing this. Why? Tax brackets are going up. People are looking for relief. They're looking for strategies. Today, we're going to talk about a wheelhouse issue that can be huge if it's done right. It's terrible if it's done wrong, and that is using a TAMRA-compliant life insurance policy kept in force for the life of the policy insured. Now, there are four. I want to go through this, Ken, before we get into the tax issues. There are four different chassis of crediting methods. You have par whole life, you have interest UL, you have indexed UL, you have variable UL. VUL is using separate subaccounts. The index is using indices, both foreign and domestic. We also have interest bearing IUL. And by the way, a little side note, Ken, don't let me forget. I want you to talk about those old IUL products here just for a quick second before we get too much into this. And then of course, par whole life. How do I know which crediting method? I say you need to do a risk tolerance test. Make sure the client understands what his risks are. There's risk in each one of these. I need to know what that is before I choose what chassis I'm gonna use or what crediting method. Ken, I wanna bring that up because it just crossed my mind again. There are some IUL contracts. Everybody says, well, we might as well just replace them. They were done in you know late 90s, early 2000s. But we stumbled across these high contractually guaranteed rates of four to four and a half percent. And are they, do they have to pay four to four and a half percent of these contracts? They do. They're, they're in the contract. It says our minimum guaranteed interest rate is 4%. Now, of course, they can play with the uh, mortality costs, mm -hmm. but when's the last time you've seen an insurance company increase the mortality costs? Not many. No, I haven't seen many. it. It's not justifiable. So the, the insurers don't like these old contracts. And of course, we would like to replace them, but in good conscience, uh, we really can't. But what we can do is I like to go in and, and frequently agents designed it for a different use where it was to protect the family and they weren't quite as focused on cash value. Well, now this, they've gotten older, the kids have gotten out of college. We can look at these old policies sitting in drawers and say, you know what, Mr. Client, Mrs. Client, we can reduce the face value down to $100,000 minimum. And what that's going to do for you is accelerate the cash value buildup because we just reduced your cost of insurance, right? Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is one of the best things you can put your money in. I mean, you can get a half percent or 1% in a CD or money market fund, maybe two or 3% in annuity. But in here, you're going to get 4%. Yes, there may be some costs in and out, mm -hmm. but, and that's why you have to run some projections, some illustrations to see what does exactly happen to test this. But gosh, it looks like this is a wonderful savings account, tax deferred, ultimately may be tax-free and now uses policy more for cash value buildup than for death benefit, then we can say to the client, if you st still need life insurance, maybe it's only for 10 years for a portion and the, the lower term insurance costs today are better mm -hmm. than on these old contracts. Or maybe we need an additional cash value policy in the form of an IUL or a VUL or whatever where we really want to punch the potential gains. Uh, but gosh, you know, 4% is an awfully good return today. And those assets mm -hmm. are valuable that are sitting in the drawers. Keep in mind, we're looking at this and remember, this is a huge boom for the client. If we can reduce the death benefit down to the regs, the DEFRA and TAMRA regs, and keep that compliant. And many of these contracts were near or past the surrender charge. So this isn't a, this like isn't a bank a, account. It's not like it's liquid. So when we're thinking about this, and I looked at the last contract I looked at, it cost me about 60 basis points off my 4% to play inside that policy. We're not going to get net numbers like that. And here's the best part, tax-free. Now put that up against muni bonds and see what that looks like. Ken, I want to talk a little bit about 
when we're talking about this, because there's a lot of strategies to be had here. There's withdrawals to basis. There's policy loans to gain. There's arbitrage on indexed UL. There's a lot of ways to play. And there's, there's also, and I hate to say this because when I bring this up, people freak out. You may, because of tax brackets, depending upon what you're looking at, you may even forget the tax-free side of this and annuitize it. Well, yeah, actually, uh, I think I mentioned this years ago when we were working on a bully case. Uh, I said, Steve, you know, this we can guarantee it in the contract is a conversion, you know, factor to annuitize. So, and, and back then we didn't have some of the riders that protected us that if the, if the cash went away, that the thing would blow up on mm -hmm. us. And we had a concern there. And we say, well, maybe the safest way, maybe not the most tax efficient way, but in this case, bowing to the client's need for safety and a guaranteed income, annuitization can be a good thing as well. Put it all on the table. I say do the math and let the numbers make the call because it's really important to do this right. We come back, we're going to manage a little bit more on the withdrawals, policy loans, and arbitrage loans right after the break. Back in the day, life insurance professionals were called field underwriters. Then, carriers trained their field force in the basics of life insurance underwriting. Today, the insurance industry doesn't educate the agent population as they once did. But now, you can have the informed risk guide at your fingertips so you can illustrate a reasonable rate class for your life insurance prospects. Just request your copy of the Informed Risk Guide at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. It's free from Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Well, we're back segment two. Ken, let's talk about this withdrawals to basis because, you know, when LIFO came online, everybody said end game over. Last in, first out, cannot do. Now, there is some mitigating circumstances because of the force out rule in the first 15 years of a contract. We have to watch out for that. But I can start taking, most people are taking withdrawals 15, 20 years out anyways. I want to keep withdrawals to basis. I have a lot of people that believe in arbitrage loans. I believe in arbitrage loans, but Ken, not in a negative year. Walk me through that. Well, what happens is, uh, you know, if you can make, let's say you can make uh, 6% or 7%, keep it, you know, simpler, 7% on gross compound return on your policy and your loans locked in or 6%. You're making a 1% spread. That's a 1% arbitrage. And that all looks great. But if you're taking money out and you hit a year where you have a 0% interest, interest rate credit, you kind of have a double whammy. I mean, it really throws you into the pit mm -hmm. and it's hard to regain. Uh, so we do have options during that period of time where uh, you know we get to choose either withdrawals or we get to choose loans, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you may choose to take money from another asset and just leave the life policy alone for that mm -hmm. year because it needs time to breathe and catch up mm -hmm. again. I like the ability, and think about this, we ran a distribution scenario in the lost decade between 2001 and, and uh, the end 2010. Mm -hmm. When we ran that, we saw that the S&P 500, which mostly is being used in indices right now, it's the vanguard of, of indices choice, 2001, two and three, and 2008 were loser years in the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you were taking distributions out, your punt position was withdrawals to basis. It cost you nothing to take your own money out if you needed the income. Or like you suggested, hey, don't even take it out of there, go to another asset. But the idea that you're actually using arbitrage loans in a loser year in distributions like that is really hurtful to the policy and you're just complicating your problem. So I'm into indexing, I'm into arbitrage loans, but I'm also using tactical use of withdrawals to basis in bad boy years. Ken, we see this all the time, people don't think this through. Well, you know, this actually illustrates another point, orphan accounts. You sell the insurance, you used to buy your whole life insurance, sell the insurance, and they never saw the age again. Mm -hmm. I mean, either he's out of the business, he's on to bigger and better things, whatever. But the fact of the matter is life insurance policies require some management. And this is our opp opportunity to demonstrate to the client that we care about them. We can build the relationship by uh, looking at these policies annually. We can impress the other professionals, the attorney's accountant, see you standing by your client once a year, looking at the stuff and say, wow, I've never seen an insurance agent really manage mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis and demonstrate the professionalism like this guy over here does. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe he's the kind of guy I could work with and refer to. I mean, you can earn the respect of other professionals for referrals. But if you're just playing the game, make the sale, move on, and just leaving the client in the lurch, mm -hmm. you're not going to impress anybody, and you're certainly not going to get referrals from the client and or their advisors. I really like to bring up carriers by name on our show. We try to be very objective, but I have to say, I want to give a little kudos to ING here. They are the first carrier that I'm aware of. There might be others, 
that really are managing a concierge, a client or consumer concierge for the distribution period. They always have this online. They can talk to these people anytime they want, figure out what's the best issue. Should I withdraw at a basis? Is, is it a good year to take this loan? Can I change my loan from fixed to variable loans? They're online. This is one of the first time we're seeing distribution management by a carrier. And by the way, remember, they're already a top 10 player in IUL for income anyways. I, to I, add this service on is just huge. I, I think it's it's fabulous. And I, I, I like to see uh, policy wrapped around being client-centric, that taking care of the mm -hmm. client first. And you know what? I just think that's good business. It, it, it's not only ethical and appropriate. I really think, how many times have you sat down with a client at lunch that you're managing money for mm -hmm. assets and something comes up, some change in their life, or, or you look at their assets and what need to make a change. I think it's not only good for the client. I think it's healthy for us as advisors. It creates new opportunities to serve the client and either rework up uh, an asset or introduce new assets to solve new problems. As we're closing on our segment, I want to bring up a kind of a bad boy issue, but I'd like to bring it up to say we've done full disclosure. Ken, we have people that really need to realize you need to keep these contracts in force for the, pol for the life of the policy insured. Right. This isn't some optional issue. You, this is a lifetime commitment. All policy loans of gain would actually be converted to ordinary income tax in the year that it would default while the, the policy insured was alive. But I want to go one step further. How many people pay the annual interest, whatever that charge is? None. None. So most of the clients that I know and the vast majority, super majority, are not paying it. So they're letting the cash values inside the policy pick off the interest charge. Well, that cannibalizes the cash values. I guess I'm okay with that. But if that contract ever lapsed for whatever reason, I'd not only have a taxable event on all the money I took out on policy loans, but I also have a taxable event on all the buildup inside that contract because the client was letting the cash pick off the annual interest charge. Well, the, these are critical issues and, and another reason why somebody has to be there. And quite frankly, you know, I'm 61, almost 62, and I sell a, a product that's designed 20, 30 years out to provide income in retirement for a younger person. I'm not gonna be around to, to help mm -hmm. them. And so having an ING that provides that kind of service or other agents who build their practices by saying, hey, let me help you. I'm not looking to sell anything here. Let me just review your stuff and take care of you. Work with advisors and demonstrate that you will in fact do that. You don't have to make money on virtually everything you do. Build that relationship, build that trust. They'll refer other business to you and, and you'll make it in other ways. Mm -hmm. So it, it is important that we focus those, on those things and make sure that it doesn't get out of hand. Well, that's our show for today. Remember, before moving forward with any of the ideas, always consult your tax advisor, legal counsel, or your broker-dealer compliance officer. And don't forget you can see any of our past episodes at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. And remember, you could be wiser as an Ash Brokerage advisor. I'm Steve Savant. I'll see you.